Hello everyone, Victor is here, and in this video I want to talk about the hydration of alkenes. This reaction is very similar to a hydrohalogenation reaction, it also follows the Markovnikov rule, forms a carbocation intermediate, and is also prone to rearrangement because of that. But there are also a couple of important differences that you need to know to make sure you don't get tricked on the test. So grab a cup of coffee, your favorite notebook, and let's get started. So generally, in the hydration reaction, we are going to be adding water across the double bond that we have between our carbons. And in this reaction, importantly, we are going to need a catalyst of some sort that is typically going to be a strong Bronsted acid, and we are going to end up with a product where one of the carbons is going to get a hydrogen, just like we had in the hydrohalogenation reaction, and we are also going to get an OH group on the other carbon. The H+, the proton, typically comes from something like H2SO4, sulfuric acid, or H3PO4, phosphoric acid. And make sure that whenever you are choosing your catalyst for the reaction, you are never going to be doing the reaction with HCl, HBr, or HI, because those ones, the hydrogen halides, they can just add across the double bond, and that will be it. You are not going to get the needed catalyst, because your catalyst will be fully consumed. And that happens because those three acids will produce Cl minus Br minus and I minus, which are good nucleophiles, and while they're going to be competing with water for the nucleophilic attack, they're just going to be reacting with your carbocation, and this way you're going to be losing your catalyst. There are two major approaches to the mechanism of this reaction. The first approach adds the H plus from H2SO4 directly across the double bond, so in this case, we are going to see something of this sort. We have our double bond, we have HOSO4 as our acid, so I will draw it like this. The alkene going to grab the proton from the sulfuric acid, giving a corresponding carbocation, and then reaction proceeds the way it proceeds. However, this approach is statistically unlikely and many instructors will consider this approach incorrect, although it does show up in some textbooks, especially if you are taking an introductory organic chemistry and not a full year organic chemistry course. The second approach is going to be where we are going to go through the formation of the electrophile first, so I'm going to have my H2O reacting with H2SO4 in a simple acid-base proton transfer, where water is protonated by my sulfuric acid like that, giving me H3O+, and we are also going to have the conjugate base resulting from my sulfuric acid, HSO4-. This step is statistically significantly more likely, and H3O+, is going to be the actual electrophile that is going to be doing the uh, attacking on our alkene in reality, so that would be a more correct way to start this reaction. And you might be wondering, well, why do I need this catalyst to begin with? Why can't water just attack my double bond directly right away? Well, the problem with that is that the pKa of water is 14, and some textbooks still show it as 15.7, so if you see a number of 15.7, that might be acceptable for your class as well. So that means that water is not particularly acidic, and it cannot supply a sufficient amount of H plus into our solution, so in other words, water is just not electrophilic enough. However, when we have H3O+, well, the pKa of that guy is going to be either 0 in one textbook or negative 1.7 in some other textbooks. So when it comes to H3O+, that is a significantly stronger acid, which means that it can easily supply H+, into the reaction system, which means that it can serve as a good, suitable electrophile. So to continue with my mechanism, I will actually look at the real example here. So let's say I have this reaction in front of me, and I want to predict what type of a product I'm going to get at the end of that. So step number one is going going to be the formation of my electrophile. And that step is essentially going to be a twin brother for every reaction of hydration that we are going to be seeing out there. Water is going to react with whatever acid we have there as a catalyst, forming H3O+. And I can represent it by this equation. Then, once I have my electrophile, I'm actually going to proceed with my next step, which is going to be the 
actual electrophilic attack. And in this case, the electrophilic attack is going to start by taking my alkene, which is one methyl cyclohexene, and reacting that with my H3O plus that I will draw out like this to make sure that I'm showing all electrons and all bonds and their appropriate movements. So in this electrophilic attack, I'm going to have the electrons from the double bond uh, reaching out for my proton and the electrons between the hydrogen and oxygen returning back onto the oxygen. That can give me two different carbocationic intermediates if I number my atoms as number one and atom number two. If I add a proton to a carbon number two, then the carbocation is going to end up on carbon number one. And likewise, if I were to add my proton to carbon number one, the carbocation is going to end up on the carbon number two. And of course, those are implicit hydrogens in my molecule, so I'm not showing them. But if I wanted to show this proton that I'm adding to my molecule, then that specific proton is going to be here in the first example, and it is going to be right there in my second example. So now I have two different carbocations, and I know that whenever I have a carbocation and I can choose between the two different carbocations, I'm always going to go with the more stable carbocationic intermediate. In this case, the one on the left, that is a tertiary carbocation, while the one on the right, that one is a secondary carbocation, which means that I'm going to go with my tertiary carbocation and I will discard the secondary one as the least likely to form. Step number three in this reaction is going to be the nucleophilic attack. So I'm going to take my tertiary carbocation that I have formed in the previous step, and now I'm going to react it with water and now water is going to be my nucleophile. So the electron pairs that I have sitting on the oxygen will be able to attack my carbocation and create a new carbon-oxygen bond, which I will show here with the abbreviation NB for the new bond. Now, this protonated intermediate that I have just created is not particularly stable simply because we have a positive charge in it, we have an extra proton in the molecule. So now the last step in this reaction will have to get rid of that proton. And in order to do that, I'm going to redraw my protonated intermediate and I'm going to get another equivalent of water, which now is going to serve as a base, and that base is going to come in and pull the proton off, returning the electrons back onto the oxygen and making the neutral product. You can also see a version of this reaction when we are going to use the conjugated base that we have formed from the sulfuric acid, so this HSO3- species. You could see something like that, but again, that is statistically less likely. And frankly, although uh, water is neutral, it is actually more basic than sulfuric acid. So here we are going to end up with a neutral product, which is going to look like this, and importantly, I'm returning my catalyst back into the system, so I have this H2O and I will show H separately, essentially that is my H3O+, plus that returns back and can undergo the next cycle of this reaction, uh, performing the electrophilic attack onto the next double bond. As I've mentioned at the beginning, this reaction does follow the Markovnikov rule. Remember that dude? So the Markovnikov rule states that X go to a more substituted carbon, while H goes to a less substituted carbon. Well, X in our case is going to be an OH, and H is going to be, well, H. We can think about water as essentially an HOH molecule, where I have H and X is my OH group. So looking at my reaction back, I had my one cyclohexene looking like this, and I have a carbon number one versus carbon number two. Those are the two carbons of the double bond. Carbon number one is connected to one, two, three other carbons, while carbon number two is connected to only one, two other carbons, which means that my carbon number one is more substituted while my carbon number two is going to be less substituted. So X, or in our case OH, is going to end up on carbon number one, while H 
is going to end up on the carbon number two, and that is precisely what we saw in our reaction. Now, remember, at the beginning, I've also mentioned that this reaction is prone to carbocation rearrangements, and that's exactly what's going to happen in this example. So let's work through the mechanism. I'm going to skip the step where I form my electrophile, so I will start with H3O plus right away. But remember that water first has to react with H2SO4 in order to form my electrophilic H3O+. So step number one here is going to be the electrophilic attack from the H2O plus onto our double bond, which out of my two possible carbocationic intermediates going to produce a more stable carbocation. Here I have an option either making a primary carbocation, which is going to be on carbon number one, or I can make a secondary carbocation, which is going to be, well, on carbon number two in this case. Now, as soon as I form a carbocation, I am immediately going to have a red flag because I need to check it for possible carbocation rearrangements. In this case, my carbocation is secondary, but we are right next to a tertiary position. And since we can uh, rearrange my carbocation into a tertiary position and make a more stable carbocation, that is going to be a win-win situation for everyone, so we are going to do so. In order to do that, I remember my migratory aptitudes, and I know that the hydrogen or the hydride, because we're going to use all of the electrons, is going to have the highest migratory aptitude. So if I can move the hydrogen around, typically in most cases, not in every single case, but in most cases, I will use uh, that hydrogen for my carbocation rearrangement. So here I'm going to grab that hydrogen with all of its electrons, and I'm going to move it around to make a new, more stable carbocation. So now, when I have a new tertiary carbocation, I can now look at the nucleophilic attack because there is nothing else I can do with my carbocation. I cannot rearrange it to give me a more stable carbocation. So the next thing here will have to be a nucleophilic attack. The nucleophile in this case is again going to be water. So this water molecule is going to come in and attack my tertiary carbocation, making a new carbon-oxygen bond looking like this. And of course, like in the previous case, this is a protonated intermediate, which is not particularly stable. So I want to get rid of the extra proton on my molecule to make a neutral final product. In order to do so, I'm going to use another equivalent of water, and I'm going to use that as a base rather than a nucleophile now, which is going to give me the final product like this. And if I didn't pay attention to my carbocation rearrangement, I would have ended up with a product where my OH ends up on the carbon number two rather than this tertiary carbon, which would have been a minor product and not a correct product if I need to uh, submit it on the exam or in the homework or something of that sort. So always remember, as soon as you form a carbocation, always double check for possible carbocation rearrangements. I can guarantee that your instructor will try to catch you on that on the exam, so always be very vigilant when it comes to the carbocation rearrangement. That is one of the most common topics to catch students on, one of the most common tricks that instructors implant into exams and get students on that. So how about this reaction? Take a couple of moments, work on that, and then let's check it together. You got it? Okay, let's see. So the first step that I'm going to do here is the formation of my electrophile. So I'm going to quickly make a shortcut and write that I have my H2O plus forming here right away and I'm not going to show how exactly I formed that one. It's the same step always. It's going to be water reacting with H2SO4, grabbing a proton for it, making a H3O plus. Next, I'm going to take my molecule and I'm going to perform an electrophilic attack from my H2O plus onto my double bond, which is going to give me the more stable uh, carbocation out of two possible ones. Now, since I did form a carbocation, I need to check for any possible carbocation rearrangements. This is a secondary carbocation, and right next to the secondary carbocation, I have this quaternary position. And that is a wonderful candidate for carbocation rearrangements, because now I can actually pull the entire carbon-containing group and move that 
instead of just a hydrogen. Why don't I grab a hydrogen here, you might ask? Well, there is physically no hydrogen on my uh, quaternary carbon, which means that it has to be one of the alkyl groups. So once I do this movement, I'm going to move my alkyl group from my carbon A to carbon B, I'm going to end up with a new carbocation that now looks like this. So my atom A is still here, my atom B is still here, and the group that I dragged across the molecule, this ethyl group, is now sitting on my carbon B like that. So carbon A, which has lost that ethyl group, is now going to have a carbocation on that. That carbocation is tertiary. So since I went from the secondary carbocation onto a tertiary carbocation, I gained the stability of my carbocation immediately here. So this type of a shift, this type of a rearrangement, we are going to refer to that as 1,2 alkyl shift. Because now we are not moving a hydride, we are not moving H with its electrons, but we are moving the entire alkyl group with all of its electrons. And of course, since I moved the alkyl group from my quaternary carbon, it's no longer a quaternary carbon, it's going to be a tertiary carbon. Now, when I have the most stable carbocation possible in this case, my next step is going to be my nucleophilic attack, which is going to be attacked by water onto this newly formed carbocation, which going to yield me my protonated intermediate, which like in the previous case, I would have to deprotonate by using another equivalent of my water as a base now in this proton transfer where water is going to come in and grab that extra proton, giving me the final product that looks like this. So as you can see, the hydration of alkenes is a good way of making alcohols in organic chemistry. And this is going to be a fairly common reaction you'll see in the multi-step synthesis throughout your entire course as well, this semester and next semester as well. So it's definitely a must know. However, you got to be extremely careful with possible carbocation rearrangements because those ones can sneak up on you if you are not careful and ruin your product or potentially get you uh, going in a completely wrong direction. Thank you for watching this video. Give it a like if you learned something new today. Subscribe and leave your questions and feedback in the comments below. Watch this video on the hydrohalogenation of alkenes next and I'll see you next time.